Hello everyone, and good morning. Welcome to the One Class channel. My name is Fidori Rome, and I'm an Honors Bachelor of Science graduate working towards medical school currently. Today we'll be going over some commonly asked chemistry questions at both the high school and college level. So if you need some extra help or just need some hand on your homework or just some tutoring, please feel free to check out the links in the description below. Uh, with that being said, let's hop into this les session for today. And that would be starting with question one. Here, this question is asking us, in passive diffusion, particles move and then it has uh, different choices here and we're going to list these out we have a from higher to lower concentrations b from lower to higher concentrations concentrations C only with energy provided and D in both lower and higher level of concentration apologies for the handwriting uh, just you can see that on the other side but this way we can just kind of break it down and I can write on top of it so with this being said though uh, the way this works is that passive diffusion is different from active diffusion because passive here I'll write it neatly because it's no longer there diffusion requires no energy input hence why it's passive okay so you know like osmosis or things like that where you have a, a semi-permeable membrane that's soluble to certain things passive diffusion is when it's allowed to pass freely without needing energy to be inputted to be able to make the molecule pass so with this being said we can definitely say C is not the correct answer because it says only with energy provided. Now, A, B, and D talk about um, different types of concentration, whether you're going from low to high, high to low, or both. So when it comes to past diffusion, if I drew a layer like this, um, and we had different types of solutions, one was hypertonic, which is more uh, particles, and one was hypotonic relative to it, which is less particles, you would find that for one, um, you want to go through the path of least resistance, okay? So you typically see molecules go through the semi-permeable membrane into the place with lower concentration, so from higher to lower. But also with that being said though, if you ever want situations where you want the molecule to move backwards, okay, that's where energy is required because now you're no longer going the path of least resistance. That's a lot of resistance there because you're starting off in already a place where you're pretty comfortable and you want to force yourself into a more crowded environment kind of like leaving and entering like a busy train in those cases you know it's a lot typically a lot easier to just leave the train and enter it because the train is such a congested area so that's kind of what i think about when i think of passive diffusion so with that being said it wouldn't be d for sure because d says that it happens in both ways um and you can see here that's not the case and as we discussed here it's from higher to lower concentrations because that's the path of least resistance, making this answer A. So A is the correct answer here when discussing passive diffusion. And let's see how we did. In passive diffusion, particles move from higher to lower areas of concentration. So that would be A. This is correct so 
now that we've discussed that, let's move on to the next question here. What is a hybridization? of N H three. Now for this one, we're going to do actually is solve for the hybridization of both the nitrogen and the hydrogen attached to it. In order to figure out the hybridization, you first have to know what this molecule looks like. And we figured that out through our Lewis dot diagram. So if we head over to the periodic table. Okay. We see that nitrogen is on the 15th column. All right. And that typically means that they have five electrons to work with. And hydrogen is on the first column, first row. Um, well, first column primarily, and that means it has one electron to work with. So in total, we should have eight. This is also supported by the electron configuration, considering that hydrogen is 1s1, so they're the first one. And that means it's um, those super, uh, yeah, superscripts, the, the one there in the 1s1 indicates your valence electrons for the because that's the most outer row, outer shell, considering that that one is the only thing there. And nitrogen, on the other hand, um, shorthand is just helium, and this is the most outer shell, is 2s2, 2p3, and these three and two added together to form the five, hence how we have that five electrons. Just as a quick review for, elect um, for those that are studying um, electron configuration. So with that being said, uh, we have five and three ones, so we have eight electrons total to work with. Okay, so with that being said, let's draw it out. We put nitrogen in the middle, considering that nitrogen has the most lone electrons, because that means it will probably have the most things it can bond with. And so we fill it out. It's sharing three. Okay, so that's hydrogen here, hydrogen here, hydrogen here, and then. Um, we need to make sure that hydrogen is also inputting its one there and there. Okay, so so far hydrogen is now complete. It's sharing one of its one for each hydrogen. But nitrogen so far is sharing three of its five. So we need to add two more electrons. One, two. And there we go. This is the Lewis structure for NH3. Now, when it comes to hybridization, to figure that out, um, the way you go about is that you want to um, figure out the amount of, um, I guess, bonds slash uh, lone pairs it has, those things. So it has one bond here, another bond here, another bond here, and a lone pair. So the way we say in terms of how it's hybridized for the nitrogen specifically, that's what we're going to discuss first, is that for every um, bond it has, you add, um, you go through the um, <clears throat> the shells, I mean, the, the subshells. So we know we have S, P, D, and F. So for S, we only have one shell, and for P, we have one, two, three, and D, we have one, two, three, four, five, because each, um, each orbital in this subshell can take up to two electrons. And as we've shown, shown the periodic table, the reason why S is one is because it's only the first two columns. P is from columns 13 through 18, which are six total columns, hence how we have three there. The D column is from column three to 12, hence how we have 10 electrons with the five boxes. And the F is a lanthanum and actinium series and that one is 14 electron spanning, which is why we have seven boxes. Now, the way hybridization works is that you just count through um, in terms of specifically the um, t amount of bond slash lone pairs. So as you see here, what we had was four. So we had S, P, one, <clears throat> so that'll be SP, and then SP, two, sp3 because this is one two three four so with that being said nitrogen is sp3 hybridized so then what would that make hydrogen theoretically well in this case hydrogen 
with nitrogen and each one has only one bond. So it'd just be right there. This, sorry, this right here would be the case for hydrogen. And that means hydrogen, okay, would just be S hybridized because that's all it can offer in this case. Now, the trick you have to know is that it depends on how many bonds, not the type of bonds, okay? So you could have a double bond, for example, like if I was talking about CO2, and I refer specifically to the carbon here, not the oxygen, this just be SP hybridized, because only two bonds right there. This is an SP hybridization. So actually, I'll leave that there just for you to have. Um, and so this is what the answer would be for nitrogen, SP3 hybridized, and in case they're asking for the hydrogen as well, because usually they spe specify which um, molecule that they're, I mean, which atom they're referring to. If they don't specify, you usually pick the central atom. It's just good to understand from both um, angles as well, okay? With that being said, let's see what they have here. Exactly, it's an SP3 hybridization uh, because the hydrogen atoms, on the other hand, oh, are just S orbitals overlapping those sp3 orbitals. Perfect. That's exactly what we wanted to hear. So they do mention both, and this is correct. So it's very handy to be able to break this down like this, because in situations where you have things that break the octet rule, for example, like sulfur, which I think looks like this, something like that. Um, the key here is understanding that in this case, because there is one, two, three, four, five, this would technically be SP3D hybridized because there's five things there. You would rarely, in fact, I have yet to see um, an element in nature that would go all the way to the F row because it literally has to overcome every single one of these before even jumping there. So yeah. So, with that being said, let's move on now to question number three. What is the Lewis structure for a bromine tetraoxide ion? BrO4 minus one anion. So, they want the Lewis structure for this, okay? So, in terms of finding Lewis structure, the first thing you have to establish is how many electrons you're working with. Uh, for those that are doing the electron configuration model, you can do that. You can verify that by checking the electron configuration and seeing the superscripts of the last shell. But for those that aren't there yet as well, you can also figure this out typically by looking at the column it's in. So for now, bromine is in the 17th column. And so that means it has seven electrons. Those in the 17th column have seven electrons to work with. And oxygen, 16th column, has six electrons to work with in its outer shell. And as I mentioned for electron configuration, the way you support that is that bromine, let me just use shorthand notation. You start from the noble gas prior, that's argon, and it would be 4s2, and then there's 3d10 because it goes through that whole d shell 4p6 the key here i mentioned the most outer shell so in this case you would circle the two and this whoops it's not 4p6 bromine is 4p5 because 4p6 would be um krypton so i miscounted there bromine is the fifth uh, p um shell elements so that's 4p5 so 2 plus 5 that's how you get 7. Oxygen, on the other hand, <clears throat> you start with helium because the most recent noble gas, and that one is just 2p, whoops, 2s2, 2p4. And when you add those two together, the 2 and the 4, you should get 6. So these are just ways to do that. I always recommend this as well, uh, not just for these. If you can see in the periodic table, you're good. But specifically when dealing typically with um, transition metals, this does help in at least visualizing which um, valence shell electrons you're working with so that, that way you can properly attribute um, what type of um, ionic uh, compound you have. With that being said, 
we have seven electrons and we have six electrons times four because there's four oxygens. And then we have this minus one here. And that minus one means that we add another electron because electrons are negative. So minus means that you're adding an electron. So in total, we have seven plus six times four plus one. Okay, and that means we have 32 electrons to work with. Okay, so the Lewis structure for this, because bromine um, is the one that's by itself, that's the one we're most likely going to put in the middle here for it to work. So we have Br, okay, 6 times 4 is 34. So we have bromine here, and then we're going to make it have one bond each with each oxygen. So that's two electrons, one bond. So we have right now BrO4. Now, let's start with filling in the oxygens. Um, right now it's sharing one of its six, so it'll be two, three, four, five, six. We continue, two, three, four, five, six, two, three, four, five, six, two, three, four, five, six. And bromine right now is sharing four of its seven. Okay, so we have one, two, three more left. Okay, and I'm gonna draw like that for now, just to be able to visualize it. And so the last part here is that we want to now add that extra electron. Okay, I'm just gonna put it here. Now, there is actually many ways to go about this. Uh, the trick is to find out the most balanced resonance structure, and that involves checking the formal charges and also you know, making sure that hopefully this follows the octet rule if possible. So with this, bromine, these four electrons here coincidentally because each oxygen is missing one. We can move this here. We can move this over here. This one can go and help out the oxygen over here. And this last one, the extra one we added for that 32 can go over there. So now we have Br, sorry. We have Br and then we have Oxygen, 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 oxygen. Okay. And now this technically should be 32 electrons because every oxygen is surrounded by eight electrons. Okay. Which is perfect for now. But now let's actually calculate the formal charges. And that is done by calculating first the amount of electrons each one has. Um, valence electrons, so let's start with oxygen, typically has six, and we're gonna subtract how many electrons it has by itself, so that's six electrons, and then we add also the electrons it's sharing, but you divide that by two. So that would equal minus one. So each oxygen has a minus one on it. And that uh, is something that maybe we can address. The bromine is seven, it's got seven valence electrons, and it has zero for itself, and it's sharing eight of them. Eight divided by two, so that's three. So it has a positive charge of three plus. Now, is there a way to rearrange this to where bromine can be satisfied along with the oxygen? There is, but it does involve breaking the octet rule. The question is whether or not we can break the octet rule. Um, for bigger chemicals, I mean bigger atoms, uh, typically, I know phosphorus and sulfur for sure break the octet rule, but let's say in this case that the formal charge is a higher priority than the octet rule. In this case, to make the oxygens, well, three of the four of them uh, balance out, we would move this, sorry. We would move one pair of electrons each to form a double bond. Okay. And, oops, not this one, this is already, already there. 
and it also depends on which one is more electronegative electronegative to see which one would overall hold the most typically hold the negative charge so in this case what I've done here is that I'm gonna keep that minus one at that oxygen up there but I've broken the octet rule and I'm gonna keep saying that because there's a high chance that this is wrong but at the same time this may be something that bromine may want as a um, resonance structure only because then the formal charges overall I mean not overall individually are closer to zero and I'll show you that through the calculations okay so that's oxygen there oxygen there oxygen here and oxygen there okay so now we have three double bonds on the bromine and another one so that's like seven in total so it, it is definitely breaking the octet rule so I don't think it's possible but you'll see what I mean by now the formal charge bromine in the middle let's start there is seven minus it still has zero by itself but now it's sharing four eight twelve fourteen and that makes it have a charge of zero so that's good the oxygens not including the one on the top okay I have four by itself and it's also sharing four which gives us zero and the oxygen at the top now is the only one to where it has now that six by itself plus two over two so this would be a possible uh, resonance structure now the, the thing that separates it between these two is that so I'm just gonna draw it out now of what we have we have the two Lewis structures okay and so the possible combinations are either going to be a bromine where it's all single bonds okay and all the oxygens are minus one and the bromine is th plus three or we have a bromine to where there's three double bonds and one of the oxygens is just a minus one let's find out what they say here I do think it's possible that because bromine is a bigger um, molecule uh, with even like different types of subshells there's a high chance that it's going to be the double bond one just because a formal charge is quite important for electrons so with that being said as you can see here it actually doesn't follow the octet rule but they do have it to where it's actually going to be this one here because the fact that so exactly the formal charge is what they use here the octet rule has been broken so don't be misled by that they use a formal charge because if they use the octet rule technically we end up with this one here of the single charges but this is what we have and that is because we had to use formal charges here and because bromine is a bigger molecule it was able to say you know what for the sake of not being all the way at three plus and I can get myself to a more of a charge of a neutral zero I'm going to now make double bonds with other oxygens so that way my formal charge gets more negative into two neutral and then there's only one oxygen left with the actual charge which is exactly what they have so this is correct um, so just remember exactly when dealing with bigger molecules um, consider the formal charge and see how you can balance it from there because some do break the octet rule just for the sake of the stabilization of their formal charges okay so with that being said we can now move on to the next question and just before that actually we can just double check we still have 32 yes we do okay so now let's move on now to question number that was question three so question four we have what are the different intermolecular forces so the one I usually like to start with for different intermolecular forces are the dispersion London dispersion forces okay and this one think of this as like the um, equivalent of almost um, gravity for atoms so everything has like a gravitational pull 
so that will be kind of a non dispersion force aka this is primarily based on your size the bigger the molecule the greater the London dispersion force just because exactly it has more of a if you think of it like planets it has more of a mass more of a um, gravitational field and it'll have that slight pull and I say slight pull because although it just depends on the size of the molecule this is known as the weakest force because then when you get to the atomic level as well you're dealing with some um, electron uh, magnetic for well electronegativity and um, difference in charges and like the charge forces and pull as well so in terms of gravity overall quote unquote the London dispersion force it is the weakest force okay and then we move on to dipole dipole now this is more so talking about that um, thing I briefly mentioned to where um, you're now dealing with more charges okay and you know how charge of positive and negative attract each other uh, magnetism and such um, and those type of electric fields uh, dipole dipole is what takes advantage of that so the reason why it's stronger than London dispersion force because if you think about it um, when you get to that small right atoms although some of them can be bigger molecules can be quite extensive there's also considering the size ratio electrons which are literally just and protons which are literally like moving about charges in itself consist of quite a bit of the atom and the molecules so when there is a net um, gathering of electrons in a certain corner versus like protons that's what forms of dipole interactions um, this is usually shown by the electronegativity difference so typically uh, dipole dipole interactions are shown when two polar covalent bonds kind of cross each other and the reason being because polar covalent bonds have it to where um, electrons are more um, concentrated in one part of the molecule than the other and that's usually shown by electronegativity greater than um, well between 0 0.4 to 1.6 the key thing here is that it is between two non-metals or just non-metallic um, molecules because when you start talking about metal non-metal that's when you get into ionic which we will discuss but the point being is that when you have things like um, I guess maybe no that's not a good one I'm trying to think of one oh like C H CO2 H2CO something like this yes like that the oxygen here would form a dipole dipole interaction with the carbon so it'd be more negative here and more positive there so when other molecules that look like that pass each other this oxygen here will be attracted to the carbons of the other molecules if that makes sense just because it has that um, pull so this is the next one so we're, we're going forces down like that so the lower we get the stronger it is the next one we have to talk about is hydrogen bonding which I like to think of it as more of a specific type of dipole dipole interaction is just one of the strongest of them so hydrogen bonding are typically let me just move this actually so you can write it down hydrogen bonding it's not typically the three ones are H and F H and O and H and N so these three right here are going to be um, hydrogen bonds uh, typically goes this way hydrogen fluoride bonds are just like really strong when it comes to hydrogen bonds as well uh, because fluorine is the most electronegative uh, element currently on the periodic table um, with that being said these bonds are just um, in a sense they trump dipole dipole just because they almost function as ionic bonds actually to where the hydrogen is almost completely rid of any electrons that surround it and the part that's attached to the fluorine oxygen nitrogen take that electron almost fully so it's almost like we're dealing with literally just a positive and negative end think of dipole as kind of like a slightly positive slightly negative and hydrogen bonding is more like an extreme version of that but you're not you don't have a full dissociation just yet and this is a good example of hydrogen bonding like water molecules uh, you'll notice that um, we have it like that it's gonna be really strong on the 
oxygen side and they're a lot weaker on the hydrogens, which is why when water molecules pass each other, other oxygen molecules atoms will be really attracted to the hydrogen atoms there just because exactly it's uh, just more of a extreme version of dipole dipole and is highlighted specifically in those three and then we get to the last one here um, ionic or ion dipole um, interaction these are just more interactions when they pass each other um, and this would be like the strongest type of interaction you can also have like ion ion interaction that's um, usually just like what forms like the metallic sheets or just like in terms, not metallic sheets, sorry, of um, the like NaCl, for example, metal and non-metal, like ionic compounds. Um, but the trick here is that once you start involving ions, like metal and non-metal, that's when you reach the strongest type of intermolecular forces. Um, think of it as now you've completely dissociated. You have like one anion and one cation almost floating separately, doing their own thing. So exactly, like cations will be greatly um, attracted to not just other anions, which is like the ion-ion uh, interaction, but also be greatly attracted to like the negative end of um, the negative end of cations will be attracted to the negative end of like hydrogen bonding or dipole-dipole. We just call it ion-dipole. So like for example, uh, nit uh, sodium, for example, uh, interacting with the oxygen here, for example. That will still be considered an ion dipole, but the point being is that because that oxygen there is like that dipole negative end, and the sodium is just literally an ion moving about, that's completely lost that electron. So those would be the type of different intermolecular forces, and I've also listed them in terms of the order of strength. Um, and yeah, let's see. So we have, yep, London dispersion forces should be the first one. Um, and so we have um, exactly these nonpolar covalent compounds. We just say nonpolar, but it is exhibited by everything. Everything exhibits a London dispersion force. It's just that because of the weakest, it becomes insignificant when you have other forces there. Uh, then we have the dipole dipole, and this is when a partly negative portion is attracted to partially positive. And then we have hydrogen bonding, which is a special type of dipole dipole, as I mentioned. And then we have the ion dipole, which is when you now have ionic cations or anions just interacting with the positive or negative ends of molecules. And last one, ion ion, that's just when exactly two, um, like a cation and an ion, anion interact with each other as well, because those everything is floating about. So yeah, this is correct. Now, let's move on now to question number five. So this question is asking us, what is the name of LIH? I almost said the name right away. <laughs> is the name of LIH. So first thing to understand is, what do we have together? We have Li, which is lithium, and H, which is hydrogen. Okay, so now the name of this compound, the way we break this down is that we first need to understand what it is. So because lithium, according to the periodic table, okay, is a metal and um, hydrogen, on the other hand, if you look at the periodic table, it's green. This is a non-metal, okay? we now have the name, well not the name, we know that this is now going to be an ionic compound. An ionic compound is because when a metal and non-metal are bonded together, that's where you form an ionic compound. So with that being said, ionic compounds have specific naming instructions. First part is, luckily we just translate the cation part of lithium, because that's the part that's giving up the electrons. And we write it like that. And then we follow it actually just by the anion, okay? Hydrogen. And now I wrote it like this because you're probably thinking, oh, that means we're done. Unfortunately, no, okay? This part here, the O gen, gets dropped, and instead, you have to now add at the end I D E. 
for lithium hydride because anions end with the IDE, even hydrogen. So in this case, we have lithium hydride as a name for this molecular, well, ionic compound, ionic molecule. Okay? So yeah, that is what you would do for this question. And with that being said, let's now see what they put. LIH is lithium hydride because you have to drop the end and add the IDE. The tricky part is knowing which part to drop out. Um, you kind of have, have to look at where you can, I guess, drop the suffix because it can be a little bit tricky and different from each one. Like oxygen, for example, is just oxide. Um, so just uh, be looking out for those as well. Now let's move on to question number six. For question six, we have, what is the electron configuration? of copper, Cu. So the first thing we have to do, typically that I like to personally, is find out the um, element number of copper. It's the 29th element, okay? So we have that information. Then we drop through just like the off-ball principle, okay? Where we have our rows, we have 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 3d, 4s, 4p, 4d, 4f, and 5s, 5p, 5d, 5f, 6s, 6p, 6d, 7s, 7p. And the way this is structured is because based on the current elements we know on our free art table. Um, the 1s, or I mean not the 1s, but the s row signifies, I mean, the S column here signifies columns one and two on the periodic table because each S can fit in six, I mean, two electrons. The P shell can fit in six electrons. The D shell can fit in 10 and the F shell 14. And the reason why is that I said the S is the first and second column. The P shell is the 13th to the 18th column, not including helium. And as you count, one, two, three, four, five, six, you see that it is indeed six. And a D shell kind of follows the same trend, but it's going to be from columns three to 12. And you can see there's 10 electrons that can fit there because that's 10 elements. And then for the last one, lanthanum and actinium series, they have 14 electrons because there's 14 elements fanning that series. So let's start with what we have here for Copper, we're going to pass hydrogen and helium, so 1s is done, so 1s2, because only two electrons can fit there. Then we go through lithium barium, that's 2s2. Then we've passed boron to neon, that's 2p6, but we also pass sodium through magnesium, which is 3s2, so that's 2p6, 3s2. And then you can see here the same thing happens, we pass argon. So that's 3p6 and potassium which is 4s2 so that's 3p6 4s2 is done but then you notice the next part is the d shell and it's 3d reason being is because once you enter the d shell you actually have to subtract the row you're in so right now we're in the fourth row so that'll be third d level uh, because it's actually going to be technically in the uh, orbital prior so with that being said, we have 3D, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Copper is there, so 3D, 9. And as we said, when you, you have the 29th element, to check if you're correct, we add these, these superscripts. So we have 2 plus 2 plus 6, that's 10, and then 12 here, 18, and then 20 at 4S2, and 3d9 is indeed 29 but this unfortunately is not correct why we have to actually draw it in the orbital notation configuration just to be able to visualize it so we have 1s2 in each orbital okay well orbital of the subshell only two electrons can fit so this would be our one this is going to be our two and because p has 
um, six electrons. That's why it has three boxes. And then in three, we have now one, two, three, four again. It has three S2, three P6. And then I'm going to draw the d orbital kind of like right here because d orbitals are relatively, actually, it'd be better if I drew it like this, just kind of next to it. It's going to be five because of the fact that, as I, we said, there was um, 10 in the d orbital. And then we're going to draw the four here, just kind of right below that. Okay. So if we fill in these boxes, we have one S2, so that's one. 2, 2s2, two, 2p6, two it gets filled in like this, 3, 4, 5, 6, 3s2, and then 3p6, sorry, we have to make sure we fill in the right way, okay, just so we can get that trend going, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and then we have 4s2 here, and then we have 3D9. So we'll go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So now that we've done this, right, we can see now just a much more uh, better visual representation that the D orbital is so close to being completely full. And the energy difference between the fourth, um, I guess, fourth shell and a third shell as that's why I kind of drew it kind of shifted down because there is enough of an energy level difference to where this electron can actually be given up and placed in the d orbital so that way we can just say okay we finished the orbital prior this doesn't always happen to um, elements in the transition metal table it's specific select elements there they unfortunately do have to memorize it's just, it's just a better representation and visual for it so that way you know what's going on. So with that being said, instead of 3D9, we now have 3D10. And instead of 4S2, we actually have 4S1. So if we were to write, rewrite that, the correct answer for copper would be 1S2, 2S2, 2P6, 3S2, 3P6. And then you, you can choose whether you want the 4 or the 3 prior. I just to keep my 3s together, so it'll be 3D10. 4s1. This would be the correct answer for the electron configuration for copper. You can also do it in um, a shorthand notation where you use the most recent uh, a noble gas, so that would be argon. And so then what we'd have less because argon consists of up to the up to the 3p6. And so then we have 3d10 4s1. Both answers work. It's just the important thing is kind of visualizing your orbital notation to see how it's actually going to be 4s1 instead of 4s2. So with that being said, as it says here, it says a field d orbital is more stable than a field s orbital. Therefore, one electron would occupy the 4s orbital and 10 in the d orbital. So we have exactly 3d10, 4s1. And this is correct. And now let's move on to the next question here, question number seven. For question seven, we have what is the molecular geometry of NCl3? So for this, exactly, those that are doing molecular geometry may also need to know like the electron configuration as well. But you can find out the amount of electrons each contributes just by using the periodic table. So in this case, whoops, sorry, let me just fix that up, keep it the same color. So in this case, um, what's going to happen here is a nitrogen, because on the 15th column, has five electrons to use. You can also show this through the orbital rotation, because it'll be 2p, sorry, 2s2, 2p3. And so you can see here, two plus three, that would be the five we were discussing. So five electrons. And chlorine, although it's going to be in the third row, it's still going to be something similar where we start with neon, and it's going to be three S2, three P5, okay? And two plus five, that's how we know also seven electrons. You can also just say that it's seven electrons based on the fact that it's on the 17th column. With that being said, we have 
five electrons plus seven times three, so that's five plus 21, 26 electrons total we, that we need. So considering that nitrogen has the most lone electrons, we put nitrogen in the center, and then we add the bonds with each chlorine. And so we have Cl, Cl, Cl. And now chlorine has so far only shared one of its seven. So two, three, four, five, six, seven, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and two, three, four, five, six, seven. So nicely, chlorine is conveniently all filled. And now nitrogen is sharing three of its five. So we just need four and five. There we go. This should be the molecular, well not molecular geometry, the Lewis dot diagram for NCl3. We can also check this with their formal charges. Nitrogen will be, so that's five valence electrons minus um, it has two by itself and it's sharing six. So six over two equals zero, perfect. And each chlorine has seven valence electrons and it has six by itself and it's sharing two. That's why you have to divide by two and you still get zero. So this is perfectly the preferred Lewis dot diagram for NCL3. But now they're asking for molecular geometry. To find molecular geometry, you first have to understand the electron geometry which is found by hybridization, which is founded by counting each of um, is founded by counting each of the um, uh, bond slash lone pairs it has. So it has one bond here, two bonds here, three, and a one lone pair. So that's four in total. So that's sp three hybridized, and that is known as tetra. Hedro, okay, but this is the electron geometry and what they want is the molecular geometry the molecular geometry now differentiates between bond and uh, Lone pair so we have a three to one split, okay? So because we have a three to one split the name actually changes, okay, and this name Unfortunately, I did forget it which was I was trying to remember earlier, but we have it here, okay, and this is going to be known as tri Gono pyramidal. So you can see here the hybridization, as we said, it was tetrahedral because we have four electron groups. And but now we have three bonds and one lone pair, which is why we end up with trigonal pyramidal. So the molecule will look kind of like this. We have each chlorine, and because the uh, lone pair on nitrogen is exerting its own um, force electronegativity. That's why the chlorines are all grouped like that, hence how we get the trigonal pyramidal shape. So with that being said, they say it's trigonal pyramidal because they have AX3E because they have um, E is the number of lone pairs for NCL. It's AX3, which comes from two. Is that what? Yep. Oh, okay. There we go. AX. So it's really a little bit strange, but yes, because they're supposed to have it like AX3E, because X is the number of bonds and E only one lone pair. So, yep. Yeah, trigonal pyramidal. This is correct. Usually, what I like to do is first find out the electron geometry just by finding the hybridization. And then from there, I can separate, okay, which one of them are bonds and which one of them are. Um, like lone pairs just to make sure that I do have the total added up correctly still together and now question number eight this question is asking list the bonds P C L oops P F O F and S I F from least to most polar. So for this, this is just strictly based off the electronegativity difference, which you're either given the sheet or maybe your periodic table mentions it as well. And the electronegativity is actually says on each molecule, I mean each atom. 
So chlorine in this case, as it says there, the electronegativity for chlorine, all right, is 3.16. And phosphorus is 2.19 electronegativity. I'm just listing out the things that are listed. So oxygen in this case is going to be uh, 2.6, oh, whoops, wrong one. 3.44 electronegativity. Uh, fluorine, which is also the strongest electronegative um, element so far that we know of, is 3.98. Okay, that's quite high. And silicon, the last one we have here, is going to be 1.90. So, with that being said, the least to most polar, um, we're going to now list up the electronegative differences right under it. So PCL, so that's 3.16 minus 2.19. The difference is 0 0.97. PF, 3.98 minus 2.19. And we have 1.79, okay? OF is going to be, um, 3.98 minus 3.44, and that is 0 0.54. And SIF is um, 3.98 minus 1.90. It doesn't really matter which order you subtract it by. The key is to have um, it written in like the absolute difference, so it's always going to be positive. Uh, just as a heads up, I just like doing, um, in that case, the greatest minus the smallest. With that being said, though, if we have the least to most polar, the least polar based on this sheet would be OF, okay, if we're going polarity this way. Then, comes up next is PCL, then PF, and then SIF. In fact, I would actually say that SIF is so polar that it's actually considered an ionic, um, because all these would technically be polar covalent bonds, so this would be an ionic bond. Reason why, because although silicon kind of, I guess, crosses the line between metalloid, metal, non-metal, um, the difference in electronegativity negativity is greater than two. And because it's a metalloid, I kind of want to say that I guess it almost counts as a metal, which is why silicon is almost as if it's literally going to be saying, here, have my electrons, I don't want them anymore. Um, so in that case, uh, the key here is that uh, you want to make sure that <clears throat> not really interested to in change the answer, but just recognize like what is you know constituting of an ionic bond. Usually the range is anything greater than two, but even if it's not greater than two, it has to be between a metal and a non-metal. So even like in the case of PF, which is quite high. It's not considered an ionic bond because the fact that phosphorus and fluorine are both non-metals. So let's see how we did. OF is the least polar, okay, and then it's PCL, so perfect, and then PF, and then we have SIF. So this is correct. And now let's move on to question number nine, okay. So for question nine, we have, what is ethanol? So for this, um, we can actually break this down based on the name. What do we have here? We have ethane and OL. So OL is typically known as alcoholic group or a hydroxide group, so that's OH minus that's added to it and ethane this is where you have to now break it down further ane is usually means for sat completely saturated um, uh, hydrocarbon so that's CH well not CH4 but CNH2N plus 2 that's what the ane means ane means that for every carbon we have 2N plus 2 hydrogens okay that is what we understand so far for ethanol, okay? So this is what we have, and now let's figure out what the F means. F in this case, because meth is one, 
F in this case would be two. And there's two carbons, it's the number of carbons you have. Because prop is three and it keeps going, butane is four. Nonetheless, though, we have F. So ethanol is going to be, um, first we have to first say C2H. Uh, now it's going to be 2N plus 2, so that would be H6. But in order for this to go with the um, OH minus, we need to turn this ethane, which is currently this um, an alkane, into an alkyl group. And the way you do the alkyl group is that it's very similar, but it's CNH2 n plus one and the whole thing has a positive charge okay a plus one charge because it needs to fill in that um, blank spot so that would be c2 h5 that is your alkyl group you have currently that's going to be now added with the hydroxide the, the alcohol group so in total we have c2 h5 OH. This would be ethanol, okay? And with that being said, the structure will kind of look like this. Where you have two carbons in each, I guess, one at the end and one at the bend, and then the OH there. Okay, so this is ethanol. Uh, the properties of it, as you can see, it's a relatively small molecule, so it has a low uh, boiling point. Um, Exactly, they know it, it's widely used alcohol, it's usually produced in fermentation, and exactly, this is how they have the picture. C2H5OH, or CH3, which is what we have here, CH2OH. So, this is what we have, it is also an organic compound, as they mentioned here. So with that, this is correct. Um, they do just go over you know, different properties of ethanol, the key thing is here is just understanding what it looks like in this molecular structure when they ask that. Um, you can go into details, you know, about its, you know, predicted boiling point and such. Once you understand more about what the electron actually looks like, okay. So now, with that being said, we can now move on to question number ten. And this question is asking, the generic metal hydroxide, so MOH, sorry, MOH2 has KSP of 5.85 times 10 to a minus 18, okay? And now they're asking for the solubility in pure water and solubility in 0 0.202 solution of MnO32. So the way we solve solubility, that's why they actually give us the KSP. We have to first understand how MOH2 would dissociate predictably based on this equation so we can actually fully write out the KSP formula. We have M plus OH minus, sorry, that's not, that's the wrong way. MOH2 dissociates into M, M2 plus, okay. Let me just move this over so it looks less um, squeezed in. M2 plus plus 2. OH minus and that too is very important because it's going to actually be uh, products over reactants so in this case actually I miswrote that MOH uh, because we typically treat them as them being solid initially we put them as solid not aqueous and the reason why we do this is because they're not actually involved in the KSP formula KSP is products over reactants but we exclude reactants that are like liquids and solids. We usually work with either it's going to be gases or aqueous solutions. In this case, we have two aqueous solutions here, both in the products. So with that being said, it will be KSP, which is a value we're given, is equal to the concentration of M2 plus times OH minus. 
and there's not going to be any MOH at the bottom, okay? So we can ignore that. But to factor in the 2 here, what we need to do is square this OH, okay? So that's what we have here for the KSP formula. It's going to be M2 plus OH minus squared. So in total, if we treated it as for every, I guess, subtracting of x here, you would see here in translation form it would be x, and this would be 2x. So we can replace this actually to where KSP, which is our given, is equal to x times 2x squared. And let's put the 2x in the brackets because the whole thing is being squared. Okay? Because for every... Um, MOH that dissociates 2 OH minus comes out. So in total, our KSP is going to be known as 4x cubed because it's going to be x times x squared. So if our given KSP is this value up here, we can say that um, our x is going to be KSP over 4 and you're going to cubic root it. So with that being said, we can go to our calculator to figure out what we get. So we have 5.85 times 10 to a negative 18, okay? And that's going to be divided by 4. And then we're going to then square root it by with 3 as the um, factor, okay? And we get our answer of 1.13. I don't know. Yeah, 1.135 times 10 to the negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And this right here would be our solubility, which is like the concentration that dissociates for every, I guess, for every mole of that, um, of this, not mole, sorry, for every, I'm trying to look for the right word here. For every molarity, so like one mole per liter, this would be how much that comes out. 1.136 times 10 to the negative 1.135 times 10 to the negative 6 molarity. That would be the solubility of that in pure water. And that's why it's pure water because there's nothing else added to it. So you can kind of guess what happens in 0.202 solution of MnO3. So in this solution here, so 0.202, you have to first think of it as First of all, they've specifically chose MnO3 here because you have to know that anything typically that is with a nitrate dissociates completely. So we have MnO3, 2, that's nitrate, is going to end up forming M2 plus plus 2 NO3 minus. Okay? And they said it had 2 point, 0.202 solution. So that's 0 0.202, meaning that now we have. 0 0.202 starting of M2 plus, okay? And this is, doesn't really matter, but we have 0 0.404 of the NO3. The key thing here is that 0 0.202. So because we have now a starting factor, we need an ice table. We have initial change equilibrium. Remember that we do not factor in the solid, so all we really have is the M2 plus, and we have the um, OH minus. So the initial is going to be, as I said, 0 0.202, and the OH minus in this case is just zero because we didn't add anything that would add more OH. We just did MnO3, 2 here. So with that being said, it's going to be plus X, and then as we said, for oxygen, it's going to be plus, plus 2X. Okay, so then what we end up is 0 0.202 plus X, and then we have 2X here. So we put that into our ice into our KSP again. We have KSP is equal to 0 0.202 plus x over, I mean not over, times 2x squared, because that would be the um, hydroxide. So then when we factor everything in, we have KSP is equal to 4x cubed plus um, let's see here. Yeah, 4x cubed. And the reason why it's a plus because you need to form some hydroxide. You cannot go, you cannot have less than hydroxide. So that means 
if hydroxide is being formed, even though we already have a, quite a bit high of um, the M, we still need more of it. That's why it's still going to be plus. So that's 4x3 plus 4x2. Well, not 4x2 actually. It's going to be 4 times 2. So it's 0.808 because 2 times 4. I mean 0.2 times 4 and x2. This will be our formula we work with. So that would be x squared. Um, and then it's going to be our values of there. Yeah, so x squared and then x plus 0. Point, or actually 4x squared. Oh, yeah, x plus. Um, oh, whoops, sorry. Definitely blacked out there. So for this one, it's going to be a little bit tricky because now we're dealing with a more complex polynomial. So what we want to do here is, I guess, solve for the zeros of what x could be. So exactly, we have, if we take out that 4x squared again, we now have x plus 0 0.202 in there. because That's what it would translate to equals ksp. So the reason why I say we solve for zeros, which is a little bit of um, math in terms of like the, when you're working with polynomial functions, is that x squared both times that zero would be zero. Because if you have zero as the um, x, your answer will be zero. So then for this though, let's just make sure we divide both sides by four still. So that'd be x squared x plus 0 0.202 is equal to ksp over four. And then we solve now for this inner part, because this is the only value that will give us to where, um, exactly where we should get a theoretical answer. So in a sense, what I'm gonna do here is that I'm gonna say ksp over four. Hmm, no, that wouldn't be how you solve this. I think we'd have to use a different method because we end up with a um, a negative answer, which is not the case. So let's see here, actually, just what they do so that we don't get a little bit too confused. So we do have that KSP AB and then in pure water, how they calculated, that's how they got the answer. And now in this case, so they have X plus 0.202 to X squared, uh, but they don't show how to do the calculation. <laughs> so we did we do have the structure correctly it's just a matter of doing the calculation for it so for this I'm just trying to figure out the best way to translate this is that instead if we did 4x3 plus 0.808x2 minus ksp is equal to 0 how then would we get this into the actual answer? Hmm. There is probably an easier way that I'm completely missing out right now. Oh, I think I know what to do. Okay. So this is what we're going to do here is that no, that wouldn't work either. because we can't just take out the X. If we did KSP over four, so if we did this over four, remember that if we added that, that's gonna be a really gross number as that wouldn't make sense. This is definitely a great question um, because now we have this polynomial here, X plus four X three, And then, well, at least we can simplify it to where it's just, um, we can simplify it to where it's x squared um, x plus 0 0.202 is equal to uh, ksp over 4. And then when we subtract that, we have x squared that ksp over 4. Um, 
this one, I'm going to leave this here just because there is probably a way to factor in for more of a complex um, solutions. Maybe actually the way you'd address this is because considering that I see now 0.202 is so big, we'd have to use a rule. This is really the only way I can think of solving it. We have to use a rule where 0 0.202 is just all we have after plus x. So instead of it doing this, it just be 0 0.202. And now that we've done that, okay, so sorry for that <laughs> mental lapse, but now that we've done that, okay, um, now that we've done that instead to where we just have 0 0.202, we have now 4x squared times 0 0.202 would equal our KSP. Because now we're just assuming that realistically speaking, the amount of x added to it is so significant that we still have 0 0.202. So we're no longer working with a complex polynomial. So then we have KSP divided by uh, 4 and divided by 0 0.202. So in total, we have KSP divided by 0 0.808 because that would be 4 and 0 0.202. So 0 0.808. And the answer we get is... Um, a number and then we have to square root that number because now we have x squared is equal to that so then the square root of it x is equal to one two three four five six seven eight nine so something times ten to the nine we have two point six nine around one which is actually the answer they get there times 10 to the negative 9. That is how we get it. So sorry about that earlier. Um, the trick here exactly is that we had to recognize that because we started with such a high concentration of M, we have to make the assumption here that it does not play in. If we had a really low concentration, unfortunately, we stuck with a um, complex polynomial, which is something that I even not having experience in terms of chemistry, because they wouldn't want to do that to you. So you have to want, recognize this rule that because you have such a high concentration of M to begin with, the amount that it changes by is near insignificant. So it's still going to be 0 0.202, which is why we don't really need all of this. We can just skip down to where it says just KSP is equal to 0 0.202 times 2x squared. Hence how we got 4x squared times 0 0.202. So with that being said though, this is correct. And with that being said, we can actually just finish up here. And I just want to thank you again uh, for joining me this session. Uh, you have a lovely rest of your day. And once again, if you're feeling like you want to go over the topics we reviewed today, just check out the links in the description below so that way we can further assist you with our very uh, capable tutors. Um, so with that, bye now and see you next session.